Great, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's, uh, I think it says in scripture, it's hard to be a, a prophet in your hometown. So it's uh, really difficult to, uh, to address y'all. I can't uh, pull the wool over your eyes because you know me uh, quite well. Some of you know me a very long time. So uh, we'll just uh, jump through that. But this is a, a really exciting time for uh, the college, I think. There's four new department heads that will be uh, named, although I think they're all internal. And uh, there will be a new director of uh, Texas Water Resource Institute and uh, IRNR uh, starting in August, I guess, because uh, Neil Wilkins is, uh, is leaving and going to East Wildlife Foundation, I believe. Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> so that's a change. So there's all sorts of uh, things and, and discussions going on right now uh, at the upper administration level about how how the college should be uh, should be run, organized, and uh, we're right in the middle of that because we've already gone through it. So what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about some of the talking points and some of the ideas that uh, I put in the uh, letter to the faculty. And then after we touch on those, because we're still fresh and uh, those are the most important uh, things I think that I'll discuss, talk a little bit about those and then uh, we'll have some fun talking about uh, about me and some of the things that, uh, that I've done. And I forgot the, the changers. But first of all, what is it that, uh, that administrators typically, uh, typically do? Uh, whenever you get a new administration, a new administrator coming in, typically they come up with a new vision and they start to reorganize, right? Well, you guys already have the vision, right? You've got the brand new vision. You want to be the best ecosystem science program science and management <coughs> program in the country. So we've already done that. Well, you've already been reorganized, so I can't reorganize you again because they're not going to split you out again. So uh, the merger is, uh, is, has happened and uh, we're moving on and we all agree that we want to be the best ecosystem science and management program. We already have our mission set out. And so most of the hard work, the heavy lifting's uh, already been done. Uh, usually when uh, you get into an administrative uh, situation, it's either going from a centralization where all the power and all the decisions are made centrally or they decentralize it and send it out to numerous uh, uh, other units or other uh, people. <clears throat> so depending on where uh, you are in this reorganization, you're either centralizing or decentralizing. I think right now it seems to be a merging uh, atmosphere and it seems to be centralizing that decision making power right there. Administrators also, what do they do? Windows of opportunity. Great things out there, great opportunities. Jump through the window and everything will be fine. If you don't follow those opportunities, there's always a boogeyman in the closet. There's always something bad that's going to happen if you don't follow those. And you watch when they talk when administrators talk about these windows of opportunity and new things that are out there, if you don't do them, they'll always talk about the boogeyman as well. The reorganization is not a new thing. This is a, a quote that's been attributed to uh, Petronius, uh, supposed to be 210 BC. But basically, he talks about this reorganization. And it's a, a wonderful method to create the illusion of progress. And that, that typically is what, uh, what administrators do. What do you do? You get a new job as an administrator, right? You reorganize because you've got to show progress. You can't take over a ship and not do anything different, right? right? So that's what administrators typically do. But this is normally what happens. Everybody's confused. They're demoralized. Things quit running efficiently. And that person gets fired, and they bring somebody else in, and he reorganizes, and the cycle just keeps on going. Right, so this, uh, this is not a new, uh, a new phenomenon, but you watch when administrators and stuff start taking over and you get new administrators, you start getting this pattern taking place of organization, reorganization, changes in focus and vision, but we don't have to worry about that because we've already done, uh, done all that. So I'm not going to reorganize. I can guarantee you that for sure. Uh, if for preparing for this, I was looking through uh, North House's uh, book on leadership and looking, and he had a great chart that showed uh, the difference between leadership and management, and a department head position is very much both of those, I think. 
And to keep the ship afloat and to keep it running, you have to be a manager. Basically, you have to manage, you have to have stability, you manage work. I don't agree with the word, at least for faculty, for subordinates. But you have somebody who's in charge and somebody who's got duties. It's basically on the short term, we work on the semester or the calendar year. Right? We make something, we educate students, we make a, a product. Uh, formal authority, basically the dean says your department head, your faculty members, and that's how it goes. We react to situations that take place on the short term. We basically tell people uh, what to do, and it's transactional. You come to work, you get paid. Right? It's a transaction. Right? So management typically is a transactional type of uh, phenomenon. Leadership, on the others, other hand, is talking about change. They want change, and it's volunteer. Everybody who follows is a volunteer. So you have followers, and the leader uh, tends to have a vision and tends to lead. But it's all voluntary under leadership side. Looking more at the long term, uh, the leader is supposed to be charismatic. You're supposed to be proactive. You're selling something. And it is transformational. If you follow me, something good will happen to you. If you don't follow me, something bad will happen to you. The boogeyman in the closet will get you. Okay, so these are the difference. But, you know, I uh, haven't talked to the other department heads yet, but I don't know what the break is on a normal department, what this uh, entails. I know for uh, the center that, uh, that I ran, this was about... Uh, 70% of the effort, and this was about 30% of the effort when I, uh, when I worked in that. But we were managing, I don't know, 15 to $18 million a year and over 500 employees. So uh, there was a lot of issues, management issues. And then selling the program, taking it out, and, uh, and trying to generate resources as well as to uh, lead the unit was uh, smaller. The talking points that I put in, the, all the C's in there, I had to work hard to get them all, uh, all in C's on the talking points. But uh, this is the way that I see uh, the department being able to increase their uh, entrepreneurial uh, side of the department. I mean, we have our, our certain funding that comes in, and uh, basically we need to generate more resources if we're going to do things differently. And this is some ideas about how that might, uh, might happen. And this was stimulated with some discussions with uh, Dr. Brisky about that. One way is centers. And I talk about egocentric centers, and that's a good term as far as I'm concerned. An egocentric center is one that's the apex. It's an inverted uh, uh, triangle but the, uh, or pyramid, but it, uh, it points to a faculty member or an individual. And they have a program. And in that program, uh, they are the center of that program, and they basically juggle students, they juggle projects, they juggle all these different aspects of their, of their job. And I think it's, uh, it's very important uh, to have designated centers. These are areas to concentrate uh, effort as well as to focus people on the outside of what it is that you're doing, and it's also a marketing scheme. You can make a, make a center, I call them paper tigers or field of dreams centers. Build it and they will come, you know, kind of uh, centers. So you, you have an idea, you make a brochure, uh, you get a phone number and a fax number, and you put that out and see if you can generate resources that way. Other ways, you come up with an expertise, and then you market that expertise, and then you can describe that expertise and turn it in. Uh, you go to a lot of websites. You go to Colorado State. Uh, you go to... Uh, uh, Duke, other ones that have programs similar to what we have, about a third of the faculty members have some center that's designated on a particular faculty member. And I think Jerry Stuth had something similar to that. And it was based on, on Jerry's charisma and his ability to generate interest and his energy levels and stuff. And I think that uh, those, are, those are fine and those should be encouraged. Just sitting around with a napkin thinking, if I was a new faculty member, what would I do? I think I would concentrate on the uh, energy industry. 
there are huge opportunities within, uh, within those areas, all the way from what they're doing on the shale, uh, trans uh, transmission lines, drilling, obviously, uh, coal mining, rivers. Uh, I don't think we touch enough on rivers and generation of power off of those and what we can do for the river authorities. Uh, wind farming, all of those are big items in the state right now. And I don't think that uh, from an ecosystem and science standpoint that we're really addressing them. I think from an engineering standpoint, they address them. And so this was just my idea of uh, putting together some, uh, some words and coming up with, a, with an idea for a center that looks at uh, the extraction, exploration, extraction, and transportation of energy resources. And this is not to exclude, obviously, uh, biofuels, which are something that uh, we're all interested in. That's just an idea. I taught a short, uh, short course last week down in uh, Houston to uh, a bunch of uh, consultants uh, interested in uh, plant identification and uh, had the, uh, and talking with them, there is a, a huge training uh, void that is being filled by some uh, smaller, uh, smaller private companies and uh, that are opportunities, I think, for, uh, for anybody who works on coastal issues, who works on uh, wetland issues. There's a huge opportunity to address some of those needs uh, down there. So there are ways to, uh, to go about it. I think centers and I think uh, these type of uh, endeavors are different from a normal research program. Some of the things you'll have to do are not quote unquote research. And did that a lot with uh, things in the, uh, in the Army. Some of the stuff we did was not research. But uh, what we did, we generated enough resources to where we could do our research while we did other tasks for our clients. All right, so that's, uh, that's one way that, uh, that you can use these centers. So working with energy, working with consulting firms, uh, wetland delineation type things, all areas that I think have great utility. Now into contracting. Contracting, I was, didn't learn anything about contracting while I was a graduate student. Shame on Dr. Smines and, uh, and, and Jimmy Dodd. But uh, uh, when I got out, I was not prepared to go into the world of contracting, trying to get resources from people. When I'd go out and ask for money or uh, ask for uh, some research funds or something, they'd say, yeah, good idea. How do we get the money to you? I don't know, write a check, I don't know, however you do it. And uh, there wasn't a lot of people at the university that were helpful in that, so I had to learn uh, very quickly about contracting and having contracting mechanisms in place to respond and get money to move uh, efficiently and quickly is very important to uh, a lot of funders. At the center we worked at, we had a general services administration contracts Two of them, two that could be filled here uh, within this department, one for env environmental planning and documentation, and another uh, contract for uh, GIS services. And these are pre-competed. You fill out a form with all of the information on it. You send them in. They evaluate it, whether uh, you fit their uh, description for these uh, schedules, and then you are given a GSA contract number. And basically, you can compete for any federal contract that comes out under these particular uh, designations. Some of them for work, some of them for research, uh, some of them for uh, anything from uh, map making. We did a lot of map making out of that, uh, doing inventory and analysis of, uh, of all sorts of different natural resources and stuff all under these particular contracts. Uh, the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit, this is an IRNR right now. I think it should be in our department because of the name of it. Basically, Ecosystem uh, Study Units, they divided the country up into these units, and uh, federal agencies join, as well as universities join uh, these different uh, regions, and then uh, there's a contracting mechanism that they use that the monies can move from federal agency to universities very efficiently with about a 26% uh, 
percent uh, indirect cost. So it's a, a, a win for uh, the granting agencies. Texas A&M is the site for the Gulf Coast. I used to do that for IRNR. It uh, also is a member of the Great Plains, and for some odd reason, a third of our state uh, is covered under the Desert Southwest, and we are not a member of that CESU. Going to their website and looking, uh, we are not there. Texas State is, but, uh, but we are not. So we certainly need to address that and get, uh, get on that. But that's a, a good, uh, good mechanism as well that has been in IRNR, but I think it should be more at the college level where, uh, where more departments uh, can use that mechanism. Now moving on to clientele groups, uh, we need to make society aware of what we do. We need to, we are relevant to almost every citizen in the state of Texas, but they don't know it. And so we need to let them know more about what we do, how we do it, and how important we actually are. I think we're one of the most, if not the most, uh, important department within the college for all the, all the good things we do. I mean, the soils people may, uh, may argue that, uh, you know, without uh, any soils, we wouldn't be growing any grass or any trees. But uh, other than that argument, I think we are probably, uh, probably the, the most important group here. And the extension and research component, uh, they're the ones that are on the front line. They're the ones that are seeing people day in and day out. I may impact uh, 100 students a semester if they stay awake. And uh, uh, these people see that many uh, probably on a weekly basis and touch a lot of different people. And so they are on the front lines. They are foundational to what we do, not only to the traditional uh, groups, but also to additional clientele groups. And that's how I see, uh, see the, they are fitting in. And they need to get on board to tell the story that we need told and to get out of the stovepipes, basically, of just uh, of just range or forestry or, or whatever it is they concentrate on and start telling the story more. And I think there are a lot of opportunities for landowners for everything from carbon sequestration, banking, carbon banking, uh, ways to generate money as well as biofuels, ways to generate resources, ecological services, way to generate resources. The traditional uses of lands, I think, are moving away just like we saw where more people make money now off of wildlife on their land, I think they're going to be making more money off of ecological services in the future off of their lands, and we need to be right in the middle of that. So right now, basically, this is the way I view ESSM, and if I was a, uh, a department head, I would come by to each faculty member and say, okay, let's draw up an a, a ecosystem structure and function diagram, and where do you fit? Show me, just point to where you fit. It doesn't matter whether you're a primary producer or whether you're, you know, you want to grow trees or you want to kill trees or you want to grow grass or, you know, whatever. Are you going to harvest the grass? Or are you going to harvest the trees? Or are you a consumer in some way? Where do you fit in this particular? You know, we got uh, biogeochemical cycling, we got some modelers, we got a lot of remote sensors. These are more uh, support uh, units down here. We've got that whole coastal unit. Where do they fit in? Where do they want to be recognized? Put together a picture of what it is we do, what holes we might have, and present that as uh, pretty much the basis for, uh, for the department and where it wants to go based on the work that you've already done. On your vision and your mission statement, that's already been decided. Now all I have to do is, uh, is try and get out there and market it. And this is a part of the list that I put in there, but I mean, look how important we actually are. We supply clean water and clean air. We sequester carbon in various and different ways. We support the uh, uh, building industry. We certainly provide uh, protein for diets. Uh, we're starting to work in biofuels and other things, uh, uh, from slash, burning slash, to uh, different grasses. Uh, getting away from foreign oil, we keep plants, uh, alien plants away. Big point, by the way, that the uh, discussions with Susan Baggett yesterday, she pointed out that this is a big issue for them. 
and we still can maintain a cultural heritage. Basically, when the earth breaks, we fix it. And that's our job. And so I think that makes us very important, and I don't think people know enough about that, and they need to. We are not too far away, in my estimation, of coming up with some kind of larger unit to present to the state. And I was watching <laughs> TV, and Valero, you know, the oil and gas company, was putting on a golf tournament. Well, why don't they take all that money for that they're doing for a golf tournament and name a school after themselves that shows how, uh, how environmentally minded they are, right? So they, if they put up the money, they can name it whatever they want. So whoever puts it up, but that was just an idea. So if they want to put up $25 million for a, uh, for a school of environmental stewardship or ecosystem science or whatever they want to say and organize it, I think that uh, the upper administration, I think, is thinking about along those particular lines. It may not be using ecosystem structure and function as the main uh, stimulus, but they're looking at ways to reshuffle the deck to meet some of these issues. And I was just trying to figure out how to fit everybody in. Well, you have the biotic, and you don't have this dichotomy, you know, that we have it, uh, wildlife has it, uh, other units have it, where you get guys that just work with the organism, an individual organism, and then we have landscape people or community people. I don't see that as a big dichotomy. If, if you break it up this way, you can have people that work on the organism, you want to work on uh, cattle, or you want to work on a particular grass, or you want to work on loblolly pine, or whatever. You can be on this side, and you want to work on the landscape, you can be on this particular side, but you ought to be able to fit into this, uh, into this realm somewhere. Uh, and uh, I think in uh, probably the next five to ten years, you're going to see something uh, something similar to that. We need to think about how we, uh, we might fit in. And the final C on this is uh, uh, working with partnerships. We can't do it alone. Uh, just going through uh, some of the websites for these different units, looking for areas of uh, uh, similarity. The Bush School, I don't think we, uh, we work with those guys enough. They even have a class on grants and, and policy over there and stuff about how that works. I think some of our students uh, that are entrepreneurs uh, might uh, get something out of that. Uh, the Borlaug, basically, uh, we're already working with the Borlaug and stuff. A lot of redundancy in GIS and spatial sciences with, uh, with geography. Uh, disturbed lands uh, with soil and crop science, obviously, and biofuels, which we also do. Uh, primary producers comes up when you look at plant sciences, obviously. Even plant uh, pathology is working on biofuels and ag engineering, all that they do. We can add more on there with, uh, uh, with ag econ and, and others, but that was just the ones that the words uh, just popped out. Things that we do that they do as well. So we need to work in groups. We need to work with NGOs. We need to work with federal agencies, obviously, and we need to work with the state agencies. So we have a big a big task, but I think we're well set to do that. That's pretty much my ideas of where the department uh, could go if the faculty wanted to do it. I disagree with uh, Dr. Uh, Kothman that the department head is really uh, uh, that important. Uh, President company uh, accepted, obviously, but the, uh, the department head, I mean, they don't teach, they don't write many grants, you know, they run around and look pretty, but that's about, you know. And they manage, keep the ship afloat, and they present this stuff uh, out there. The important ones are the faculty. Jeez. I mean, you take the department head out, what happens? Nothing. <laughs> really? I mean, you know, this semester we ran just fine with your leadership, obviously, but, I mean, nothing really changed, right? And so it's the faculty that's important. You guys are going to be the ones doing the work. You're going to be doing the center stuff. All I'm going to be doing is say, hey, go get them and support you all the way, right? So I disagree with Mort uh, on that issue, but that's the only thing I ever disagreed with Mort on was that, uh, that particular point. But I was born in Commerce up near Paris, so I was born near Paris, uh, and that's where uh, TAMU Commerce was. My father was on the faculty, well, he was an instructor, really, uh, at uh, East Texas State, 
which has been absorbed, right? So that's where uh, I was born. I was the baby of the family. My sister was the smart one. My brother was the strong one. And I was the sly one, right? <laughs> so to get my share, we were all one year apart. And so to get my share, I had to, uh, I had to figure out ways to uh, manipulate the system. My dad couldn't make a living uh, during the baby boom area, era with uh, three children and stuff and on an instructor's salary. So he went back in the service as an officer in the Army. Went to Triple Hospital. If you ever go to the big island or to uh, Oahu, the main island in Hawaii, you get off the airplane, you look up on the mountains, and you'll see a great big pink building. And that's Triple uh, Army Medical Center. It is the main medical center for all the Pacific Rim all the way, and this, this was during the Korean War, so he ran the biochemistry labs uh, for the Army at Tripler uh, Army Headquarters. Then we went to an interesting place in uh, uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds, and this is where they do all the chemical and biological control stuff. My dad worked in a five-story building, at least five stories above ground, no windows in it, and there were three fences around it. The outer perimeter fence was to keep people out. The inner two fences were to keep people in. If the bug ever got loose, wasn't anybody coming out of that building until they got it contained, right? So that's what, what he did. He was a biochemist uh, and a biophysicist. But then the space program started, and he switched. He got out of the service, went to civil service, moved back to San Antonio and to San Marcos, where my uh, mother was from, and they designed the environmental systems for space capsules. And that's what he did. What they eat, what they drink, where the CO2 goes, where the oxygen comes from, where the waste goes, all the environmental systems to keep the astronauts alive, basically inside that little capsule was what, uh, was what he worked on. He worked on the Mercury uh, uh, program, he worked on the Apollo program, and he worked in the Gemini program in between those, uh, those two until his uh, retirement. And they also had, his family had a ranch up on the Bi uh, Blanco River uh, off of Devil's Backbone between uh, Wimberley and, uh, and Blanco up there. They had a small rock pile that, uh, that they tried to uh, make money off of. This is McGeehee. It's spelled M-C-G-E-H-E-E. -E. That's my mother's maiden name. Her family came before the revolution, the Texas Revolution, uh, and settled in Bastrop after the conflict. Uh, both, uh, both brothers that came out were in the, uh, on the uh, Texan side of the revolution. And to uh, reward them for their service, each member got a league and a labor of land, which is about 4,500 acres. Well. My, uh, my ancestors used to run on, on the old uh, uh, Spanish Trail or the King's Highway uh, all the time between Bastrop and San Antonio. And uh, so one of them picked 4,500 acres along the San Marcos River on one side and the Blanco River on the other side. And that's where they took their 4,500 acres. And there's a low water crossing there where they established that's uh, that's named after them. I wish they'd have kept it in the uh, family because it's one of the main uh, places that you can get access to the San Marcos River and float, uh, float on down to Luling and down that way. So uh, some great economic opportunities uh, missed again. But uh, they don't own that land anymore. You can go across the crossing. It's still there. If you take uh, the old Bastrop Highway or the Kings Highway around uh, San Marcos, you go right, uh, right through the area. My uh, maternal grandfather was a ranch manager. He uh, uh, managed the Galvan Ranch down in Webb County for a long time. And then he switched and he managed the uh, uh, ranches for W.L. Moody Jr., who was the big insurance uh, millionaire, multimillionaire from uh, Galveston. And he managed theirs. He actually died from uh, wounds that he received when he was doctoring a, a cow with a screw worm. And he got, he roped it, he got off, and the cow hit him. And uh, he sustained some wounds, and uh, several uh, months later he died from that particular thing. And my dear sweet uh, mother, when 
she was a child. But nothing really happened very important to me. Uh, growing up, moved around a lot, did all the kid things. But I went to uh, Southwest Texas, which is now Texas State. Uh, I, uh, from about the fifth grade on, I lived in San Marcos. So I basically just quit driving to the high school and drove to the college. Spent my first two years as a history major, which was uh, a great time, enjoyed that. Uh, then, uh, like many of our students, I lost focus and stuff. The next thing I knew, I was working in a steel mill in Seguin, structural metals uh, industries. And uh, that's not me, but it's uh, similar to what we did. We used to take old car bodies, put them in a great big kettle, stick electrodes down in it, flip the switch, and melt the cars using the, uh, the heat from the arc of the electricity from those electrodes. Then you shovel in a bunch of uh, different types of chemicals to harden up that uh, steel. And then you, what they're doing now is they're shooting air in there to mix it up. And when you shoot the air, that's when all the sparks fly off and stuff. And uh, if you don't think that'll focus you, give that a try for about six months in, in Texas in the summer heat. That's not air conditioned, by the way. So this weather felt cool when you walked out into it from that. Well, this was not a good time to be uh, out of school as well. Because Uncle Sam, uh, our dear uncle, was sending us uh, to uh, Southeast Asia for free in uh, that particular era. This was the Vietnam era. And so I figured out real quickly that that's not what I wanted to do. So I joined the Navy. And I was not on the Pueblo, so don't tell people I was. But uh, because I could read and write, and most importantly, because I could get a top secret security clearance because of my father's background, primarily, that. Uh, I went in and uh, was a radio intercept operator, which is basically an electronic spy. What you do is you sit around and you listen to all the uh, traffic that goes on uh, by your enemy, and then you keep track of all that. Well, the Pueblo, if you remember back in those days, was basically a spy ship. And it would float into uh, enemy territories, North Korea and other places. And they'd get all excited, and they'd throw their radars out and, and scramble all their airplanes. And you'd record all that information, and then you'd drift out again outside of their territorial waters. And you could plot their command and control, all that sort of stuff, all that military stuff. But that's basically what we did. Greatest thing that ever happened for uh, military intelligence was satellites. That concentrated all the communications. Don't think that anything that you say or do that goes through the atmosphere is not heard by somebody. They, they copy everything, and they send it all to NSA, to the big computers at Fort Meade, and it goes underground, and who knows where it goes from there. But just about everything, there is not a thing that goes on that uh, they don't know about. And uh, did you hear recently about the Turkish air, airliner or airplane that got shot down by Syria? Well, it was doing exactly what I'm talking about. It was, it was a radar plane. It goes into their airspace. The radars fix on them, and then they can tell where the radars are, so they can go in and bomb the radars when it's time to invade, and then they can't tell where the planes are coming. Well, they didn't get out in time, and they shot them down. And when you listen to a radar, it goes beep, 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 beep. And as it gets faster and faster, that means they're locking on you. So if it's a steady beam, then you're dead. So. Anyway, when I got back out of the service, I got to a college campus, and I haven't left since. 40 years of either going to school or being in a land-grant university. That was uh, what I did. I did my master's, and this is where I met uh, Wayne. I guess we've known each other longer than uh, just about anybody. But uh, down on the Chaparosa, looking at uh, cattle activities, following strip uh, herbicide treatment. Uh, had a great time working down there. Then I came back and finished a PhD with Dr. Smines, working on cupgrass in the genus Area Clara. Uh, was a Tom Slick fellow and all those uh, normal things that graduate students do. This was an unfunded uh, project. Ah, here I am. I spent a lot of time getting that look, really, getting that long blonde hair. Uh, this is what you guys remember me looking like when I was here before I came back. I'm like a tree now. Each year I just get bigger and bigger, right? But back then I was thin, had the mustache going, old George Tanner and his wife, 
This is Rob Gordon, uh, who went with Eli Lilly. I don't know what he did with a range degree in Eli Lilly, but made millions of dollars uh, selling drugs uh, at that particular time. But that reason I show this picture is not to show you how pretty I was, but basically I followed George Tanner to the University of Florida. And that's uh, when we were there, New and Ziegler Hall, our home, great place in a forestry uh, environment. So I was basically teaching all the plant courses finishing off a revision of Dr. Gould's uh, textbook uh, at that particular time. And this is where I first learned the difference uh, in conservation. You guys didn't teach me this either. You didn't teach me about uh, Pinchot and the first uh, rule of conservation is development. You didn't tell me that. You didn't tell me about mirror and tree huggers and all that sort of stuff. I didn't get any of that until I got to uh, the University of Florida and it became real obvious working on public lands coming from Texas a lot of difference and a lot of different things out there that were going on so I moved uh, Steve Archer was responsible for me moving I uh, helped a friend move to Colorado State uh, to keep it from being a complete boondoggle I went by the university and gave a few talks talked to some of the faculty talked to Steve Archer he was sitting in his chair and uh, he said, oh, you might be interested in this, and reached into his trash can, actually, and pulled out a job announcement. Said, this just came across my desk. You might be interested in it. Looks like it might follow your field. So I went. I got the job, and so I moved to beautiful Colorado State. All this right here is now char. There's, <laughs> that's been burning up there for a couple of weeks now, and all those beautiful homes, all that nice area are now, uh, now dust. Great place to live, great small University, land-grant university, uh, absolutely no state funding at all, hardly at all. If it wasn't for out-of-state students in IDC, the place would fold up. Rich kids from the east want to come and ski and stuff, and so more than half of the students there are out-of-state. Right? So that's uh, why they were, uh, were there. i got to tell you about the phone call. I was sitting in my office, a student came in carrying a shrub, which I know absolutely nothing about at that particular time, and said, do you know what this is? And I said, well, it's in the Rosaceae family, probably a Curtagus of some sort. I don't know, but I just saw the dendrologist going to his office in another building, and so we left, went into the dendrologist. He was looking at the plant. The phone rang. It was for me. There were three people in the universe that knew where I was, myself, the dendrologist, and the student. But the phone rang, and it was for me. He gave me the phone. I was kind of confused. What is it? It was a guy from the Army wanting to find somebody to go to southeastern Colorado to help him identify plants. But he had misdialed the phone number, and it came up to this guy's. So that whole Army stuff that I did for the next 20 years was on a misdial phone call. And that's, that's the gospel truth. And uh, I never did figure out how he got a hold of me, but, you know. He did. So I went down to the Pinion Canyon Maneuver Site, 250,000 acres uh, down there. We were lucky enough to get on before there was any kind of, uh, this was a new installation, before there was any kind of maneuvering. So we had pre-treatment data, and then they come down and train on it and stuff. And uh, basically, the land condition and trend analysis program for the Army was generated from, uh, from those initial plots that we put out down there. And, uh, so uh, some people, uh, again, I still had the look, but uh, this is Carrie Manius, one of our students that uh, worked on that. Her husband's Mike uh, Mosley, the president of the society now uh, of range management. And the guy who took the picture was Jay Whiff. Remember, he came and uh, got a PhD in uh, systematics and stuff. And uh, so he, they worked on the project as uh, well. We had a great time, uh, great time down there. This is the guy that made the phone call. That's Vic Deersing. He was the, the man who started the inventory monitoring program for the Army. Steve Warren's right over here. You might remember Steve, one of our uh, students as well. This is me uh, back in the old days, still with the look. And uh, basically, I worked for about a week with Dr. Deersing down on Pinion Canyon. He left the project with me and went back to work at Champaign-Urbana. And that's, uh, that's how we got involved. That was even, that was in 85. This starts out in 88 when the center was actually designated, but this is our funding line. Goes right, uh, right through there, so it's a, kind of a, a slope, a uh, few ups and downs, but a uh, 
pretty uh, impressive uh, line of, of funding. This little curve right here, we were in a normal distribution. We had peaked. We'd done most of the inventory monitoring this time. We were starting to go down. If nothing had changed, we'd probably drifted out, and it would have been a good career just doing that. Well, what happened was that my most important publication, I think, it's great literature, but it's on the condition of U.S. Army lands, and I took all the data that we collected for 10 years and summarized it and put it in a pamphlet. It was actually a, a presentation, but I just took the slides, made pages out of them, and put verbiage on them and just put it out. And I doubt if you could probably even find a copy of it now. But what it did, it got into areas within the military that I wasn't able to get into. They figured out that their training lands were an important asset for the training community. Before, it was all within natural resources. And their funding levels way down, right? So there's a little money to do inventory and monitoring and stuff. But what happened with this, they took over the responsibility from the environmental side and put it in the training side. And that's where all the money is. And so that's what all of this increase here is, is from switching over from the environmental side over to the military side. So that was probably the most significant thing that I'd ever written. Uh, my greatest administrative effort was when I left, this continued to go up. It was not tied to me. It was not egocentric anymore. It, uh, it went uh, up, and it ri it's right about uh, 22 to 25 million right now at a steady state in that. We'll see what happens when the budget goes down here pretty soon. Most of our funding actually came through the Forest Service. We set up a cooperative agreement with the Forest Service. The Army has what they call MIPRs, which are uh, like a checkbook. Basically, they can write a whole scope of work and uh, a whole funding document on one page of paper, and they can transfer that money internally or to other federal agencies. And so they would send the money to the Forest Service. The Forest Service then would send the money to us through a cooperative agreement. The money would move in a week. All right. So you could move. And the, the size of the MIPRs uh, can be anywhere from $1,000 to $10 million. All right. So that's, how, that's one of our big sources. But we also had GSA contracts. We worked with industry. We were on contracts with industry. We had IPAs, other cooperative agreements with other uh, federal agencies. Uh, when I left, that was the breakdown. So this. This shows how uh, important different mechanisms are for that. Number of employees, same line. Shows the same line when I left. There was 546 employees. Uh, half of those uh, were temporary hourlies, mainly summer work. Uh, this was the foundation of the center, these administrative professionals. We got funding each year somewhere around 7 or $8 million at the beginning of each physical year to support those people on various military installations where we identified them, kept them trained, and uh, maintained them. And then all the other monies was for uh, different types of tasks. This is the way we were organized. Basically, we had a research unit, a cultural unit, an environmental compliance, GIS, field operations, and business. We all sat on uh, an executive committee, but uh, really, we were a matrix, and everything went through business affairs. We had thousands of uh, contracts for each installation. The money just didn't come in to one pot. We had to track every contract that we came in. This was the most important part of that whole unit, is being able to keep up with their money, what the money was spent on, how it was spent, and all the rest of it really functioned off of that. Those are the sites when I left we were working on all the way from Germany, Puerto Rico to Okinawa and Korea, Germany, Hawaii, or, uh, Alaska and Hawaii, big uh, for the unit, but those are all the installations that, uh, that we touched uh, and it's in even increased uh, since I left from the areas that, uh, that we influence. I was basically trying, uh, in my position, to go from the science side to the policy side. And this is uh, about the best uh, contrast I've ever seen of uh, the difference from the science side. Basically, we're objective. We want proof. We're, we want to be rational. We take measurements. 
and we make little incremental progress. But when you're dealing with policy, they're basically deadlines and crises, right? Their time frame's completely different. They don't care a whole lot about facts, right? They care about public opinion and about what people think. It's frequently emotional, and it's often uh, perceptual. Working with the Army, they want an 80% solution, right? It's better than flipping a coin. It's better than doing nothing. But they don't have the time to wait for a 95% solution or a 99% confidence interval, right? They're on a whole different time scale that they work. And so that's what I basically was. I was an eco-politician. Basically, I had, had a few facts, but I had to get into that realm to do that. So we came up with a term for that, uh, an eco-politician. So we try and influence them with facts, but we're in their, uh, in their playground. I did get to continue to do research. Uh, did a lot in Hawaii with endangered species. Anything that uh, we happened to come across that looked interesting, I could uh, skim a few dollars off and uh, do some research and do some publishing. I continued to teach grass systematics primarily uh, there in Colorado and uh, do that uh, effort just because that's what I like to do. That's why I was in the university basically to do research and to teach. The other was just kind of on the, uh, on the sideline. Uh, I retired from that position and came here as associate director for IRNR. Uh, basically, I was fired from that position. Uh, I uh, take full responsibility for that. I was duly warned before I came how the organization was run and uh, that it was egocentric, which is fine. Uh, but I accomplished most of the uh, things that I set out to do. One was to get back to Texas A&M. Another was to do uh, uh, work on a grass book which uh, I have done. And the third was trying to switch over IRNR to a uh, center that had a, a foundation that wasn't so, uh, so much an inverted pyramid, but one that was a normal pyramid where you had foundation and then uh, it really didn't depend on who was sitting at the top to function as a, as a center. Well, I didn't accomplish that one, so, but I accomplished a few of them. And part of my punishment was I got to go to Iraq with the Borlaug Institute. Uh, one of my charges was to work with the uh, Borlaug and work with the institutes uh, trying to get them together. So uh, they sent me to, uh, to Iraq and uh, made it through there. These poor people, I tell you, what a mess. What a mess. The, uh, and it's not the Borlaug's fault at all. The Borlaug had nothing to do with it. But the State Department has uh, provincial reconstruction teams. They have in their budget, they have uh, people that are there to help reconstruct the economy and the social structure and rule of law and all of those things. Uh, there, the Army comes in and they have civil affairs groups uh, that do pretty much the same thing, but the time scale is different. The Army's there for 18 months, right? And they have boxes that they have to check off. This money has to be spent. These people have to be helped. We have to win the hearts and minds of the public and all those sorts of things. So they have to check the box. The State Department's there 15, 20 years, right? So the time scale is completely different. So you have these two units fighting all the time, and they take about six or seven of us naive people, and they drop us right in the middle of this, you know? Say, so here, go out and figure out how to help these people, mainly to help keep uh, young people on the farm so they don't get it, go to the city, and uh, enter the slums and get in trouble, right? That was the theory behind it. Well, these poor people had already met 10, at least 10 times, if not 15 times, with people that were trying to do the same thing, figure out how to help them. So all we did was just go back and redo what had been done and stuff. Well, I was fairly vocal about, uh, about that and that we weren't accomplishing uh, the tasks that we'd been set up. And they said, oh, shut up. Uh, you go back to Baghdad. and." Uh, and they left somebody else out in, the, out in the field. So I guess I got fired from that job too. So there's two for two since I've been back. Projects I'm working on, uh, I think it would be so neat to be able to use your cell phone just to scan a plant and have the name pop up. Facial recognition. If they can recognize seven billion different people, right, using fac facial recognition, they ought to be able to identify 10,000 different plants, wouldn't you think? I mean, it should be, should be fairly simple. 
So uh, working on that, I'm finishing off a natural history atlas of Texas counties, which will probably be online. And I would like to finish a, a revision of grass systematics before I uh, quit the university. Whether I'll get to that or not, uh, I don't know. Last three publications have been books, Grasses of Colorado, The New Guide to Texas Grasses, just came out in a little uh, uh, pamphlet on the distribution of grasses in, uh, in Texas. Last slide, I promise. Uh, this is uh, about the administrative philosophies. Most of you know me. Uh, you know, I'm kind of, that's why I'm in taxonomy. I like dichotomies. You go left, you go right. You got good, you got bad. You got black, you got white. I'm kind of that kind of guy. I'm pretty simple that way. Although I know the world is gray, I prefer to think of it as black and white. It's easier for me in my mind. But I don't micromanage. I don't like to be micromanaged, and I certainly don't want to micromanage anybody. And I have no, neither the time nor the desire to, uh, to do that. Obviously, open door policy and a department head, if anything else, they need to be a facilitator. They need to make sure that the faculty and the staff and the students have what, it need, what they need within reason, not what they want, but what they need right, to accomplish their mission. And that's what a department head or an administrator should be doing. This should have nothing to do with Bob Shaw. This should have to do with the faculty and what they're doing. And the success in Colorado was because we concentrated on the mission. It wasn't about individuals. It wasn't about me. It was about accomplishing the mission that we had. And that's the same thing that, uh, that we need to concentrate on here. It doesn't have to do with me uh, being the point man, it has to do with uh, accomplishing the mission that uh, has been set forth by the faculty already. And you've already done the heavy lifting, so it's all, it's all pretty simple now. But I think it's really, really an exciting time you know, for uh, a lot of changes going on, a lot of stuff uh, happening, and a lot of opportunities uh, out there as, as times uh, change. So. That's about all I have. I appreciate uh, your time uh, for coming over here, and uh, it's uh, hopefully I haven't bored you too much. But it's 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 difficult to address you all in that uh, in that way because of how long we've had uh, had a relationship with some of you. So for all my uh, all the good things I've done, it's because of y'all. All the bad things I've done is probably because of y'all too that you've tainted me. But uh, I'll. Uh, I'll take the blame for those. So, Anyway, uh, as I said, my last two jobs here, have, uh, I've gotten fired. So I imagine if I get this one, I'll get fired from this one as well. So it happens. You know, it's kind of like a baseball coach. You know, you can't fire the faculty. So what do you do? You change the coach. And, you know, so I don't worry too much about, uh, about that. So.